Okay, we're going to tie a fly called the llama. It has no llama hair in it. That wing is uh, woodchuck. And uh, that wing is also uh, the key feature of this fly in that it determines the length of the shank of the streamer hook that you're going to use uh, for the fly. And you note that the underfur is left in this wing. Uh, that's an important part of the fly as well. What I meant by the hair determining the length of the shank, uh, this piece of woodchuck fur that I've got here uh, still on the hide, you can see it has a black base, uh, then it turns to ginger, then it turns black again, and then you have kind of a ginger set of tips on this. And we want to keep all four of those color bands uh, in the wing if we can. And so here's, here are three size six hooks, and uh, this one I've got in my hand now is an eight extra long hook. And as I hold it up to the hair, you can see if I tied that hair onto the hook, I would have uh, the, uh, approximately the right length of hair. And uh, it looks like this is probably the hook we're going to want to use. Now to show the difference, this is about a five extra long hook, again size six. And uh, these tips, you can see, would be, stick out way beyond the bend. And it, it's marginal. You probably could get by with that and not have too much of a problem with hair wrapping around the hook bend. Uh, but this hook shank is way too short. This is a three extra long size six. And it, you can see if I tied this on full length hoping to get all four color bands that these tips here would stick uh, way beyond the uh, bend and, and would be just the hair would just be too long for that hook shank. So here if I can get this back in front of the camera there we go you uh, you can see that that length is just about right for that hook shank and so that's what we're going to use for this is a uh, eight extra long size six hook I more commonly tie this in size 10 so you have to kind of search for shorter woodchuck hair uh, Ten, uh, eight and ten are my favorite sizes for this so I, I start to thread and I wrap all the way to the bend then I'll wrap a little bit back forward so I can trap my tail in and uh, tie in the tail which is a grizzly hen hackle. So I'm just going to select a feather from up here in the top of the uh, uh, neck and then uh, just stroke some of these fibers back and then grab a clump and uh, once I got that pinch between my fingers I'll just pull those fibers off measure them against the gap. I uh, want them to be about the uh, width of the gap in uh, length. And then I'll just trap these right on top with a soft wrap here and then this next wrap will pull the material right up on top of the shank and I'll hold it on top of the shank as I wrap back. What I'm going to do is wrap back to uh, just about uh, the end of the barb on this hook shank and leave that hanging out the back <clears throat> and uh, get ready here to tie in my ribbing material now on a large hook like this I use a flat tinsel uh, but the original pattern actually calls for oval but it's hard to get oval big enough to look proper on this uh, eight extra long hook like this uh, and uh, the color of the rib is supposed to be gold so uh, what I'm doing here is trapping the gold side against the shank and then uh, when I start wrapping that tinsel folds over and the gold will be what's exposed giving me the rib color that I want and I wrap right back to the uh, end of my previous thread wraps and then put this tinsel in the material holder and wrap to the front now having wrapped to the front it's time to tie in the body material <coughs> and the uh, body material on this is uh, is red floss and this is a four strand floss which a lot of people have trouble with uh, four strand floss it just doesn't want to wrap smoothly and it, it's something of a pain but uh, using it in a bobbin like I do <coughs> excuse me using it in a bobbin like I do and uh, uh, tying this thread off and letting the thread hang in the bobbin cradle lets me wrap using that bobbin in uh, it works out fairly well. It, it uh, builds a decent body and you can do it fairly quickly and it's not too hard to taper the ends. Let me get that bobbin out from behind my cradle. <laughs> and here's 
here's the secret of it right here and that is uh, rolling this bobbin tube up close to or keeping it far away from the hook shank now as I roll it up close like this uh, or about like that right within the top eighth inch or so it gives me uh, a tight wrap and leaving it down low about an inch like this you can see how it allows those fibers to kind of spread see how they they want to spread if you got the the bobbin way away uh, or way down low so by turning this tube back up close to it it restricts and keeps that stuff from spreading out and you can see, well let me loosen the wire on this I've got my my uh, wire bobbin bent too tightly here let me spread that a little bit so uh, the wire is looser on the spool and uh, I'll start wrapping again now you see uh, it's staying fairly close and I'm gonna let this bobbin ride up closer to the uh, shank here as I go now keeping it about this distance you're gonna get a nice smooth wrap and the fibers are gonna stay together now as I get back towards the back and the bend of the hook uh, I want this stuff to start to spread out because I want my ends to be uh, thinner both the front and back end of this body I want to be uh, to have a little taper on them so as I pull the bobbin down and and uh, get it away from the shank, you can see that the uh, the uh, floss tends to spread out again. Now uh, as I get here into the back, see that one piece starts leading towards the rear. Well, that's actually a plus. That's what I want. Now I'm just going to bounce this bobbin a couple times, flatten that out a little bit, and start wrapping the other way. And see, I've got only a couple wraps of a single strand at the bend in the middle I want these strands to be very close together so I brought that bobbin tube up and I'll keep it up and close uh, all the way back to its the uh, to the front of this thing and th th those close wraps of floss material uh, build up more and will give me a thicker midsection to this body on this fly which is exactly the uh, shape that I want. Now getting back up here towards the front, I'll spread this back out or pull the bobbin down, let it spread out which is going to give me thinner material and I don't go quite all the way to the front and I change my direction back and you can see now I'm letting the bobbin ride up which is going to pull all those fibers close together. Keep wrapping. As I get here to the back I want to spread down or pull down and let these fibers spread out and I bounce the bobbin a few times to get it to uh, to spread and, and uh, give me my taper. Now I didn't go quite all the way to the back and I'm going to start moving towards the front again keeping it at a distance that keeps the wraps together. And as I get up here to the front I spread it down and the, the uh, wraps will start to widen out and give me a thinner front end and that's it that's enough of a body certainly on this I have my taper so I get that bobbin cradle out of the way I wrap in front pass under and wrap behind that floss then a wrap in front one more in back for good measure couple in front there and I can cut that floss off and I know it's not going to be uh, unraveling on me I know it's well trapped and secure and I've got a cigar shaped body and uh, what I'm going to do now is wrap my ribs so I'm wrapping about seven or eight extra wraps up here uh, I can wrap plenty of them because I'm going to build a whole head I bring my bobbin right up against the uh, shank of the hook take this tinsel out of the cradle and start wrapping I want uh, they generally say five to seven wraps of rib material on a on a fly. Uh, I'll probably end up with eight or nine on this fly because it is an eight extra long shank. It, the the spacing of the wraps would be uh, too wide if I tried to hold it back to five or seven. So uh, maintaining this space, and I'm going to end up here with about eight wraps. And my threads hanging right there. It's just been unwrapping as I wrap my rib forward. I just grab my thread tie off this tinsel <laughs> get that I had a pretty long piece of tinsel there and uh, 
I've got that secure by wrapping behind it, then over it, and then in front of it like I normally do. And I'm just going to rotate this so that I know I'm cutting above the hook shank. Cut that tinsel off, and uh, we've got the hardest part of this fly done in that we've done the body uh, and the rib. So what we need to do now is is put the wing in, and I'm going to use that. Uh, woodchuck piece that I uh, sized this hook to earlier. I just kind of straighten up the hair until I get the tips relatively even because I, I don't want to stack this hair because I don't want to clean the underfur out of the uh, hair clump that I cut off. I want to leave that underfur in there. Uh, the underfur helps bulk up the shoulder area of the uh, of the fly and, uh, and allows the uh, the woodchuck hair, guard hairs uh, in the wing to stand up and and uh, keeps them separated. The, the guard hairs keep those, uh, the underfur keeps those guard hairs separated out and gives more action to this fly. Now you can see it's about the right length. I get all my color banding uh, that I wanted. So I just got to neaten up these tips a little bit so that I can secure them to the hook shank and uh, because I've got to do a collar wrap on this I want to bring that thread back just a little further than it is because I have to have room to secure this uh, wing and then uh, add my grizzly collar so I want to be about two hook sizes back from the eye or two eye sizes back from the eye so I lay this hair in here I've got it on the side closest to me I make a, a loose wrap around it and now I'm going to pull real tight and this next wrap of thread should pull that right up onto the top of the hook. If if you don't want to use this technique where the where you tie it in on the side to you and make a soft wrap and then use the next wrap to pull it up over the top, you can certainly use the pinch technique and uh and have the pinch set it. Now, as I pull this away, you see I got quite a bit of hair that came out that wasn't secure in there and that's and that's fine, that's normal, and it kind of thins that wing out a little bit. But you can see the uh, the guard hairs and the banding of the guard hairs and how it holds the uh, uh, the underfur, I mean, and the banding of that underfur and how it holds the, there's the underfur there, how it holds the uh, tips of the guard hairs out. And that it really does help put motion in this fly. And you can see here the wing length is just about right. So this was the right length hook to pick for this fly. Now I'm going to pay the price for not changing to 6 aught thread. I've got 8 aught thread. <laughs> I'm going to just kind of speed this up because, uh, gee whiz, I had to make a lot of wraps to build that head up. Now I've got a grizzly hackle here. I'm going to size it to uh, make sure it goes back. Uh, the fibers go back about a third of the length of the shank. And I'm going to select one of those uh, uh, feathers prepare it by stripping the fluff off the bottom of this clip it to get rid of the uh, excess quill there and we're just going to tie this in and make a about a one and a half uh, make one and a half turns of hackle to build us a, a, a wet fly type collar so I'm just going to trap this quill here you note the uh, the bare quill that I've got sticking up above. It just helps me get my wrap started and get the feather in position so when I do my wraps they are uh, uh, all cone shaped and pointing to the back. Now I'm going to bend this quill. I've got excess quill here. I'm going to bend it over and then wrap over that bent portion and that really locks that quill in. There's no way that's going to slip out of there. I might break the quill but I won't pull it loose uh, from my wrap certainly not bent over and locked like that. Let me cut off this tag end. And smooth that up and get ready to uh, to make our hackle wrap. And I've got plenty of wraps on here. I'm going to wrap this in reverse. And uh, the one, one and a half wraps that I make while wrapping in reverse aren't going to be enough to unwind any great amount of thread in my bobbin. Uh, will be right there waiting for me. Now I'm going to use the uh, fold and wrap technique where I come in here with my thumb and pull these pieces, uh, stroke these fibers to the rear 
and let me turn my hackle plier over here so I get it in the right position. There we go. And now see my hackle fibers are just starting to wrap onto the hook and I've got them started so they're pointing to the back like they should be. Stand this up so you can see it a little better. And I can stroke and fold these and wrap at the same time. I'll just move that a little bit more. Stroke those fibers back and wrap. And and there's about a wrap and there's about another half that gets me beyond my start point and that's just uh, just what I want and I don't need a real big collar I've already got a lot of bulk in here because of the underfur so I'll just fight my way through these fibers here and get that thread on the outside towards the eye make a couple of wraps let me get that one fiber that wants to stick out and pull it back there we go. Pass the uh, thread underneath the feather. Come up and go through to the eye side of the hackle again. And I've got two wraps over that. That'll hold it. I rotate so I can cut without cutting, uh, worrying about cutting my thread. And I've got my hackle collar on here. And uh, if if it wasn't for the fact that I think eyes add so much to this fly, I would say, gee whiz, we're done. I would just go ahead and uh, smooth up this head and tie my whip finish knot. Uh, but after the whip finish knot, we're going to paint eyes on this fly because I, I've convinced myself that this fly works much better with the white uh, background, dark pupil eye that uh, has uh, is originally called for in the pattern and has always been a part of the fly. So let me cut that off and uh, kind of change view here and I'll show you what I use to paint uh, my eyes and that's a toothpick and I just use my leather man to make myself a new toothpick uh, when I need it. Uh, I take a round or today most of them are square toothpicks but and I just get the scissors out of my leather man I cut this off with that cut off I just uh, flip out my file blade that's uh, here in the handy dandy leather man and smooth up the end of that and because that most of them are square now I'll just kind of round it off uh, but you can you know gee whiz you can make up a couple toothpicks like this and leave them laying around and uh, they last forever and they do a real good job of giving you different eye sizes. You've got this this bigger end here that I've, I've uh, rounded and smoothed up and now you got this tapered end and I'm just going to flatten that out a little bit by rubbing it on the file. And uh, that'll give me the smaller size that I need for the pupil. And another way of doing this uh, instead of bothering with these toothpicks, some guys will just use uh, finish nails. You can see that would, this finish nail would be just about the right size for the white background. And uh, you can get smaller finish nails that have the end this size, so that, or you can use the point if you flatten the point down on a finish nail. And it's a little more permanent, but the toothpicks work really well. So I'm just dipping into some uh, white head cement testers, model airplane paint, anything like that will work just fine. And you just take that uh, toothpick that you've rounded out and that's not quite a big enough dot here. And grab just a little more uh, paint or head cement, white head cement. And we'll put a little bigger eye on here. There we go. Flip that over, get a little more cement on my toothpick. And there's my white background for the other side. And after letting that dry and uh, uh, letting it harden up so I don't have to worry about it smudging. I can put uh, my black dot in here. Flip that over on the other side. Get a little bit more paint. And another dot. There we go. If I was smart I'd leave well enough alone but I try to widen this one out a little bit. You can see here I push down too hard and I smudge right through to my white no big deal. I just grab a little more and, and uh, dab it on there and, and life is good. Uh, I, I will normally tie up uh, eight or nine of these and then just paint all my eyes all at once. Uh, but there you have it with the eyes. Once you put those eyes on you just put some clear head cement over it 
and uh, there is a llama tied using rotary fly tying techniques. It's a very good, especially good brook trout fly.